let's now focus on how we spend our waking hours, which is working. Now, the whole concept of how we work is changing before our eyes. I mean, Dominic, you've coined the phrase flex workforce. It's a whole new type of workforce that's emerged during COVID-19. So I'm going to ask you to explain that. Well, I think it's useful to, to look at what's happening behind the scenes during the COVID pause. And one thing that's happening is that every company is rapidly reinventing themselves and they're accelerating uh, automation processes that maybe they were planning to get to by, say, 2023, 2024. They're doing them in 2020. And that's going to have a huge impact on how work is going to evolve. Uh, and to many people, it's going to be very scary. A lot of white collar jobs are going to go, as well as the, the blue collar ones that have been hit immediately by the COVID uh, effect directly. Um, but at the same time, there's a huge opportunity. What you're seeing is companies like Twitter and Facebook and MasterCard uh, increasingly are saying, you know, you can work from anywhere and you can work in a way that allows you to have a more flexible life. So you can actually combine taking care of your children, taking care of your parents uh, with working as long as you get the job done. Um, so I think it's going to be scary, but at the same time, it's going to be a time of great opportunity. And part of it is how do you sort of handle this new normal? And one way to sort of think about it is really to step back and say, you know, 200 years ago, you saw the move from the farm to, to the factory. And that was because of automation of farming. And then about 100 years ago, people went from the factory to the office. And really, this is kind of of that size, right? It's the next big shift in work. And it's uncomfortable, it's scary, but it also offers huge potential. So, Maddie, obviously, you're a bit of a futurist yourself, and AgeWave has built its reputation on looking ahead to the future. Do you see the same patterns here or something different? Well, I see the patterns, and I think that Dominic is right in terms of the acceleration of the trends that was in place already. So yeah, that's a given, but I don't see it as being all that great. I mean, yeah, there's some really positive things about it, especially for companies who can give up their rent on their commercial space and such. But let's take a woman. Let's take a woman who has three kids at home and let's say she's a lawyer. She's working at home, trying to get meals on the table, trying to organize her house and trying to keep her job and trying to do a great job so that she can get, as Dominic suggested, get those promotions in the future, maybe get a little bit of a raise so that she can actually afford this lifestyle. So I don't see it as being like this all amazing, wonderful thing. It's, it's complicated. And I think yeah. a lot of the burden falls on women. Oh, I think that's such a good point. I think, uh, the responsibility of this whole pandemic, uh, meaning that the responsibilities that come financially, especially, really fall more on us now than ever. We have to take control of our own situations. And I, I couldn't agree with you more. I think that that's, that, that does raise a lot of complications. Michelle? Well, I think we have to be um, careful about uplifting this trend because it's still going to leave behind a lot of people um, minorities in particular who often have jobs where you can't do it at home okay. because they are heavily concentrated in the service industry. Clearly, you can't serve people their dinner from your dinner table. Um, and so, you know, it, it, when we talk about this trend, we really are talking about higher paid workers, middle income workers, people oftentimes with degrees and things like that. If there are other jobs like her customer service representatives and things that companies can put in place where people can work at home, it might work for them. Yeah. Um, but I think that the trend is really going to be skewed towards higher income workers. I think these are all very genuine issues. Um, some of the research I've seen would suggest that uh, parents of children under 12 have been most negatively impacted, whereas uh, parents of older children or that are out of the home have actually been able to adapt better. So I think that's, that's true. I think having to handle young families has been very, very difficult. What I've seen, I have lots of friends who have teenage kids. They're ready to pull their hair out. They're trying to figure out how am I going to deal with my son not being able to graduate and not even sure he's going to college next year? I mean, the yeah. psychological, the mental health issues are very real there. Uh, I think that grown up 20 somethings, my daughter, who is 33 years old, moved home 
for a period of time because it was the best thing for her to do. And so that we went back to some patterns of high school. And I'll tell you something, yeah. I didn't love those patterns. <laughs> um, I hope she's doing the dishes now, at least. Are you kidding? <laughs> I'm wondering. I think that when we talk about flexible, work schedules and working at home, I think we need to broaden that definition. So we need to talk about, okay, the ability of people who can and whatever jobs they have to work from home. It, it saves you a lot of money, it saves you a lot of stress, the commute. There's all the issues about boundaries, but we'll just set that to the side. And then when we talk about flexible work schedules, well, people who can't work at home, what, what I think we should be more willing to do is that people can have hours that are different than nine to five that they can you know, maybe split their shifts so that they're home when their children get home from school, if their kids are being schooled at home because they're online. Um, so that maybe workers who can you know, work late at night and in the morning, I mean, everybody, I think the corporations and companies have to be flexible in how people work and where they work and when they come to work. Um, and then, you know, we, then we got to talk about the child care issue. It is hard to work from home when you have little people. They see you here. My dog just bust through my door. <laughs> you know, it's in my office. It's a lot of distractions. Um, and so we talked about that. And to Maddie's point about the college, I'm, I'm less worried about this not ability to, you know, have traditional graduations or even be on campus. I actually think it's good. Because far too many people have spent far too much money under this guise that my kid has to live on campus or have this certain yeah, good point. experience that has cost a great deal of money and makes them take out student loan debts. Right now, about half of the cost of going to college is not to tuition and fees. It's actually room and board, which is food and rent. Uh, and we're borrowing for really them. Good. It's a great yeah. plan. To, to borrow for their rent. And yet we are saying it's okay for students to borrow for their rent and food. So it's I, crazy. I agree. It, it, you know, it's a bit striking though, Michelle. I mean, I might suggest that, right, that the, the need to go to college is so that you could enter a flex workforce job, right? And, and to not have that college degree, right, is to put yourself at a disadvantage as much as it is to have student loan debt, right? I mean, it's they're almost equally uh, bad in some respects. But, right. but if I could offer, I think you could see some new models where you could do uh, two years of community college, maybe combined with some branded stuff that allows you to get broader experiences that you can get there and start flex work while you're still at college, living at home, save all that money and end up without debt, right? I think we need to be thinking about this time to really examine every single model, how work works, how college works, uh, all aspects of education. And, and to think about the opportunities. And I, I don't deny that I think this is gonna be very painful. What I'm trying to do is think about, well, as painful as it is, what is the new path? I mean, how do you reinvent your life in this, in this new world? It's not as straightforward as you might think. I mean, on paper, it sounds like a panacea to be working at home, but I know that there's a lot of people in my company, for instance, working at home, they miss the social connection. Uh, they miss, they feel socially isolated. And the effect that that has on your mental health and your well being is dramatic. So I think there's a whole side of this that we're not exploring. It's not just a financial issue. And by the way, the mental health issue becomes a financial issue. You know, we have to stop and evaluate what the fallout is from that, you know, both the positives and the negatives. But it's definitely here and it's happening faster than we ever expected. So let's take a look at the lighter side of this pandemic. So Bob and I have been scouring the internet, searching for some funny and maybe imaginative, imaginative ways to use your home office space. And we found this picture on insider.com. This is a therapist who has repurposed her shower <laughs> to make a workspace and maybe get some privacy at the same time. So, Pam, you know, I thought I had a short commute, but I think this woman, you know, takes the pride <laughs> on commute time. But, you know, re you got to remember, she's the therapist. So where's the couch going to go? <laughs>